I was at the Library of the Rhine with 11 researchers sitting in the library. And we were all sitting there because we had a visitor. And on the one end of the table, she was sitting and she had this little wheel that she had created and put it inside a jar. And you can see she put her hand next to it and it's moving. But you know, there might have been wind from it. But watch, it stops in a sec. Now you have to pardon the shaky hand here. This was, I'm sitting at this table and she starts moving it with her fingers from outside the jar. Look at this. She's moving it in different directions. Everyone's jaw dropped. I was sitting on the other end of the table and my first thought is nobody's recording this. So I took out my cheap phone with its cheap camera and I ran down the other end and I was trying to get focused on this. So it's really not a very good quality recording, but she's moving it in different directions. Now, this is where it started. When you see this right in front of you, you see this type of thing happening, you can't ignore it. All this is, as you can see it on the left here, or on the top on the left, it's a plastic wheel that's very well balanced on top of a very small metal pin and it's enclosed in this, in this uh, plastic case and it's very sensitive. If you blow on it a little bit, it'll spin really easily. They are so sensitive to air currents that just by putting your hands around them, you're creating what's called convection. Your hands are a little warmer than the air around it and when you do this, the airflow will start to move between your hands and it'll start a little air current and that air current will cause these wheels to start to spin. So we moved on to using one of these food storage containers. So we tried, let's see, we tried wind, we tried air, we tried heat, uh, I even took a little heating unit and heated it up to almost 100 Celsius on the outside and then I was like, wait, that's too hot. Brought it down to about body temperature where someone's hand might be there. And again, I found there was no effect on it. Uh, we tried uh, static, we tried magnetism, we even tried light. We used little lasers and we tried different light colors and seeing if we could shine it and make it move in any way. No effect. We could not find any physical mechanism that would enable us to move. We banged on the table, shook the table and things. And even doing this, we did get a little bit of wiggle in it, but it never started spinning, ever. So here we thought, now we have a good instrument that we can use for testing to see if somebody can affect one of these wheels inside of a contained environment. You can't really see really well that there's a, a container around this, but there is a plastic cover on this. And you'll notice the wheel is turning very slowly in a clockwise direction. You can see just a little bit, you can see it moving there. There's someone sitting outside of it with their hand next to it and sometimes intending for it to move, but not focusing and really, re come on in, come on in. Not focusing and really, really trying to make it move a lot of times. A lot of times it's just a matter of, I have this intention and I'm next to it and I'm gonna let it happen. The other thing is this was our instrument. This was not a side wheel that someone had brought with them or built, this was our instrument. We bought it, well, Graham brought, bought it and brought it to the lab. And so we had complete control over the instrument. No one else had touched it, no one had messed with it, they hadn't modified it in any way. So we knew what it was going to do under normal circumstances. And we have what we call, right here, we have a Cyleron random event generator. This came out of the pair labs and it was produced by them. It uses a process, I'm gonna get a little technical, okay? It uses a process called electron tunneling. And essentially what it is, is they take, a, in the electronics, they take a capacitor and they turn around the wrong way and they try to shoot electrons through it and they shouldn't get through. But because of quantum events, occasionally one will get through or occasionally a few will get through and they count how many get through and they use this to determine a random event. We are typically looking for variations that, I'm gonna give a little statistics here, are greater than two sigma, two standard deviations. This means that there's about a 95% chance that we're seeing something, there's only a 5% chance that what we're seeing is, is randomness. 
that we're randomly seeing something here. So if somebody's trying to get a bunch of ones and we get a two sigma variation, that means that they're probably having an effect on the system. In our pilot studies that we did, I was working with someone and I was running a number of sessions with him and trying to say, hey, can you affect this random number generator? He got consistently 13 out of 30 sessions, he got greater than a two sigma variation. This is a huge effect. It's really, really big. And he did it from Georgia. He was in Georgia and I was in the lab in North Carolina over Skype. And he was able to have this effect from Georgia to be able to, normally you wouldn't see this, if you ran 30 trials, you wouldn't expect to see any of them would have this level of var variation normally. You might get one or two, but having 13 out of 30, that's over 40% of the trials that we had that were, that were greater, that were a large variation. And most of you know that we have this bioenergy lab. I've spoken about this a number of times before. Some of you have been in this room. Um, and the bioenergy lab, it's a double dark room. It's a very dark room in the, at the Rhine. And in there we have this equipment called a photomultiplier tube. It's a very sensitive piece of electronics. It will measure a single photon of light every half second. Like I said, this photomultiplier tube, the PMT, it detects light, except there's a shutter on it, like a camera has a shutter. And if I close the shutter, there's no light that can get into the camera at this point. So what we did is we had someone, Ed Edwards, who's up here, who um, was having very, very consistent results in our lab, who was always getting very big numbers and affecting the photo, and seemed to be producing a lot of light. Well, at one point, we had him in the lab and we closed the shutter so no light could get in just to see if there might be something else going on, see if he might be affecting the equipment in some way. Well, we saw some continuing results. And in 10 of 17 sessions that we did with the shutter closed over the last couple of years, we saw variations in photon counts that were significant, statistically significant when the shutter was closed. This, there was nearly 200 times more photons in the experimental sessions than there were in the control sessions. That's tremendously large. There was a lo extremely large effect that we were seeing here. So for the past few days, we've been working with Ed Edwards at the Ryan Research Center to see if we could differentiate whether he was producing biophotons or whether he was having a direct effect on the electronics of the system. And these are the typical results that we've gotten. This beginning part is a baseline where we ask Ed just to sit and do nothing. This part here is a test to see if Ed can affect the machine when the shutter is closed, when it would be considered to be psychokinesis or PK, directly affecting electronics. And you can see we got readings where we should get readings between 0 and 5, which we got during the baseline. We were getting readings close to 350 at some points, and these over 150. So we, it's apparent that it is affecting the electronics of the equipment. This section in here is another baseline. Almost immediately after the baseline, we opened the shutter and asked Ed to again try to affect the machine. And in this portion, we again see a lot of variation, more variation than we saw when the shutter was closed. But this variation here is much larger, up to 750 photon count. To me, this is an indicator, and then finally we ended up with another baseline. So you can see very distinctly the differences between the area of focus and the baseline time. This to me is an indication that it is affecting the electronics of the system, but when he is, when the shutter is open, we are also having higher readings, which tells me not only is he affecting electronics, but he is also producing light and biophotons. So we've been talking about people t intentionally trying to do something, trying to affect different devices, trying to affect uh, uh, these wheels that are spinning around, but there's also unconscious or unintentional PK. We, walked into, we went into the lab and designed an experiment 
exploring the effects of mood and emotion on a real-world computer system and network environment. People do seem to affect electronics. And is it due to mood or emotions? Um, we asked people to come in, and we asked them to complete a series of computer tasks. They were really simple tasks to get a reward. They had to do it within a time limit. There was a time period of 20 minutes. They had to finish all the tasks in 20 minutes, and they would get a reward. Um, they were, like I say, they were pretty simple tasks. It was just typing things in boxes, moving something across the screen, doing some matching with different cards and things like this. There were games that, I, that we put together. Um, but we had two different groups. In the experimental group, we actually obstructed their ability to do it. So the idea was to induce anxiety in the experimental group. In the control group, they did the exact same task, but no malfunctions. So the idea was that the, the participants would also self-rate their anxiety before and after they were doing these tasks. Well, at the same time, in the same room, there was this independent network that was running constantly. I had two computers. And I set up this process so that it would send messages back and forth between the computers constantly, on and on and on, never stopping, all day, all night. And it sent the same messages over and over again. And I knew exactly what they were supposed to be. I was looking for errors in the network process. It had nothing to do with what the people were doing in terms of playing the games. That was completely separate. But I thought, if they're getting more anxious, Perhaps we'll see errors in this network that just happens to be in the same room. Maybe there's an unconscious effect. Will their mood, will their emotions affect the operating network system? The second hypothesis was confirmed. There were more errors observed in this independently running network, not even involved with anything. There were more errors when people were anxious than when people were not anxious. And this is a pretty strong indication here with a p-value of 0.038 the effect size 0.45 it is an indication that it seems that anxiety it seems that emotion and mood does seem to have an effect on computer systems how do we make sense of all this all right so is pk real we've looked at a whole bunch of different things tonight we looked at edgely wheels and we saw them move in very controlled situations where we used very uh, closed containers where the wheels were not moved normally and they still seemed to move in those containers in, di in different conditions. We looked at micro PK affecting random number generators. We saw uh, a situation where someone was able to affect these random number generators from over 300 miles away and was able to produce results indicating that there was an effect that was measurable based on their intention. We saw electronic PK in the bioenergy lab where no light was causing the effect and still we were getting electronic PK effects. And finally, we saw a situation where it appears that mood is affecting network systems. What do you think? Is PK real?